Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, and um, welcome back. Um, today's show is going to be a little bit different than the other shows. I went out and about during Keene this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to um, capture some of the things that are happening in, in Keene. Um, first one is, the, is going to be about the new prescription drug drop box at, at the police station. The second one was the unveiling of the, um, the bust of Granny D, New Hampshire's own, from Dublin, um, New Hampshire. And the third was going to be a few minutes concerning um, the Clarence DeMar race, the 34th running of the um, Clarence DeMar uh, Marathon. Clarence DeMar, the winner of the Boston Marathon, I think twice, from the Keene area. <clears throat> so the first thing is going to be the new prescription drug um, drop-off box down at the, um, the police station. And um, it's with a coordination of, um, here it is, Monadnock Voices for Prevention, um, the Rotary Club, which pay, help pay for the drop box. There'll be a number of other um, sponsors and benefactors that will be um, named later. Um, and the Keene Police Department. As you've probably known, a couple of times, we've already talked about the drop-off box um, a couple of times. But now, if you have any excess prescription drugs, you can just walk right down to the police department and you just drop them right in the um, drop-off box. And the police department, um, no one knows who you are. They just dropped in and um, they will be disposed of. And <clears throat> here's some of the things, the Keene Police Department medication disposal drop-off box. <clears throat> Basically, accept, acceptable drop-off is prescription medication, controlled and non-controlled. For example, if you have excess morphine or other um, serious painkillers or um, non-control, we also know that a number of um, medicines um, used in a violation of the doctor's orders can cause some serious problems. Over-the-counter medication drugs, as we know now, we, we know there's some serious side effects from the over-counter medication drugs. There are some that you even have to show your proof of age to buy now. Other ones, vitamins. Some of us are in a vitamin craze. We buy vitamins and all of a sudden we don't like them. The idea is just drop them off. They can easily be disposed. Again, we don't want these down the toilets. <clears throat> Syrups, ointment, creams, lotions. For example, bathing salts. Bathing salts are now finding out that it could be quite dangerous. So these syrups, um, cough syrups, easily, let's go get rid of them. Things that are totally non-acceptable, needles, syringes, those are important because diabetics and other ones, um, or you unfortunately may have a, an attic in your, your household, you don't want to throw them in the drop box because that puts the, um, the police in a, a problem when they're trying to take them out. And the last thing we want to do is when we're trying to benefit the, um, the community that a policeman gets infected by um, some illness due to contaminated needles or syringes. There's a numerous places to drop off needles and syringes. I think at the hospital they have a um, needle syringe box in the, um, the bathroom and a few other places around town. Thermometers, batteries, or other products which contain mercury or cadmium. Again, a lot of batteries as a way to dispose of batteries, especially we don't want mercury into the system. Medical waste items such as IV bags, used bandages, gauzes, or biohazard. Again, that's a, a no-brainer. We, we don't want to get, we don't want to again pass on um, possible contaminants. Other thing, aerosol cans. Again, aerosol cans. We don't want paint in here. We don't want any of these aerosol cans, you know, like Raid or bug spray, because this is going to be incinerated, and you don't want to put aerosol cans in your incinerator because they can be quite dangerous. Her hydrogen peroxide. I know some people want to dye their hair a little blonde or hydrogen peroxide to combat um, cuts and infections. But again, hydrogen peroxide can uh, interact with other um, chemicals and sometimes create um, hazardous gas. Personal care products, non-medicated shampoos, sunscreen, etc. Those are easily d disposed of. <clears throat> so again, that'd be right down at, at the police station, right down on 350 Marlboro or maybe 380 Marlboro. It's that 350 Marlboro complex and it's easy to get rid of them. So 
Why do we want to get rid of these um, medications? Simple, one, it's not healthy to just put them down the toilet, or put them down the sink, because while it's not at hazardous level right now, more and more water departments are also showing up um, these, chem these chemicals and switching drugs in the water supply. The other one um, for people, if you go to the Keen Sentinel, Wednesday, September 21st, 2011, if you get a chance, it's under the health section, a new academic, nation faces a growing prescription drug um, problem. In 2009, for the first time, more people died from drug overdoses than they did for traffic accidents. Almost, almost 38,000 people nationwide died died from um, drug overdoses. And who is it affecting? It's not affecting like we used to think before. You know, we have a stereotype of, of drug users. One right here, drug facilities more than doubled <clears throat> among teens and young adults between 20, from 2000 to 2008, years for which data is available. Deaths more than tripled among people age 50 to 69 the Times analyst firm. In terms of sheer numbers, the death toll is the highest among people in their 40s. These are not drug addicts, and a lot of times these are people who they don't have the great eyesight, they go in and they take the wrong bottle, an old bottle, or they don't pay attention and um, they double up or they triple up. The idea is, let's go, let's get rid of the um, prescription drugs if mom and dad or grandpa, especially grandpa and grandma, they don't need the drugs, bring them down, get rid of them. You could be saving um, your grandmother and grandfather from um, serious um, problems. Also another um, big one that the report shows up, it's just not um, painkillers. There's um, a lot of antidepressants and other drugs like Zoloft that's um, prescribed for anxiety. Um, <clears throat> One of the problems you may have with anxiety or a little depression, a death in the family, someone loses a job or you have a serious accident. Then you have a little um, anxiety, you may have a little depression, but when it's done and it's over with, it's best to get rid of um, those drugs. Again, as the report shows, a lot of these um, anxiety drugs and antidepressant drugs are showing up. The kids are using them. They gave an example Let's see, a young man, 19 years old, a 19-year-old Army recruit who had just passed his military physical took a handful of Xanax and painkillers while partying with friends. A groom anxious for his upcoming wedding overdosed on a cocktail of prescription drugs. A teenage honor student overdosed on painkillers his father left in a medicine cabinet after a surgery years earlier. A toddler was orphaned after both parents overdosed on prescription drugs months apart. As we can see, prescription drugs are a serious problem. If you don't need them, get rid of them. New Hampshire is one of the few places that you can. Again, I can't emphasize it more. If you don't need them, bring them down to the police station and get rid of them. It's just too dangerous to have them hanging around the house. So. What we're going to do right now is we're going to go to about a nine minute clip about the drop off box down at the, um, the police station. I'm going to have to apologize. I did the filming. I'm not the, the greatest at it. And so a couple of times they may cut off a little bit too early, but I think there's enough in here that you can get the gist and you'll be able to know the location of the drop box. And if you have any questions, just give the police um, a call. Give them a call. Do not use 911 for the information. Just use the regular phone line. I have to apologize. I don't have the number with me, but it's in the book. And so we'll come back and talk to Granny D right after um, this little film clip. New medication drop box here in the Monadnock region. Uh, I'm Kelly Steiner. I'm the project director for Monadnock Voices. And we are a regional network of many partners. It includes government, education, safety and health, business, uh, and nine different coalitions. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple of the, a few of the coalitions that have really been involved with this effort, which are the Monadnock Alcohol and Drug Abuse Coalition, Creating Positive Change, the We've Got Your Back Coalition, 
and the uh, Greater Monadnock Medical Reserve Corps, I'm going to call them a coalition, and the uh, Community Connections for After School Networking. These are all groups that have been very involved as well as the Hinsdale Community Coalition in this effort. And together we work uh, to reduce substance abuse in the Monadnock region. And this effort is just one piece of many things that we're doing. But it's one of the priorities uh, for the Monadnock region given that we've had so many safety and disposal issues attached nationwide to uh, prescription uh, medication and medication use. And I'm going to turn it over actually to Steve Klein. Steve is the Deputy Director of Field Operations for the partnership at drugfree.org, formerly known as the Partnership, I believe, for a Drug Free America. Right. And he is from the national level um, and is going to briefly speak about the scope of the issue here in, in our country. Um, you certainly didn't come to see me, but I, pre I appreciate that you uh, invited me here today. Um, I'm amazed, first of all, uh, that this truly is a collaboration. It, it's the public sector, it's the private sector. I know the Rotary Club was involved in, in helping make this happen. So congratulations to, if there's representatives from all of those organizations here. Thank you for, for what you do. Uh, what we're seeing nationally on, the, on the, the issue of the misuse of prescription drugs is, is really staggering. Uh, you probably know it on the local level as a significant problem. Nationally, the research shows that about one out of five teens has told us that they have misused pres used prescription medications other than as intended. And please don't get me wrong, we absolutely believe that prescription meds used as intended are wonderful things. They make people's lives, quality of life better, they prolong life, but used as, as misused, they, they, are, they can be deadly. Uh, I believe our research shows that it's about 2,500 kids a day experiments with prescription meds for the first time a day. That, that's a staggering system, a number. And part of the reason that this is happening is the availability and you know part of the reason we're all here is to help reduce that availability. People go to medicine cabinets. Uh, I, 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 as you probably figured out by now, I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch, but I just dawned on me recently, somebody told me real estate open houses. Kids will go with their parents to real estate open houses so they can go in the bathrooms and check the medicine cabinets. Okay? Um, it wasn't on my radar screen as a kid. You can tell by the color of my hair. I'm, I'm a leave it to beaver generation guy. And, and we never thought about stuff like that. And I think that's part of the reason that, that this is, you know, we need to get this on the radar screen of, of adults. The efforts here. You know, I bet every one of us can go home today and take a look. And we have medication that was prescribed 10 years ago. I, I saw a gentleman come in and said, with, with a bag to be the first. And, sir, I congratulate you on that. Uh, but it's vitally, vitally important. We do have uh, some resources that the partnership provides to provide information. Well, one is a website devoted specifically to the issue of prescription medications. It's called Not In My House. And... The other is a resource or another website called Time to Talk. The importance of responsible adults talking to their kids about this issue, making them aware that this stuff is dangerous. You know, again, use as intended is fine, but misuse can kill you. And that, you know, what we want, what we all want, is healthy kids. So you can access all of these resources at our website, drugfree.org. You have a wonderful resource here in the state of New Hampshire for the Partnership for the Drug-Free New Hampshire. That website is drugfreenh.org. I encourage you to go there. And once again, on behalf of the partnership at drugfree.org, I commend you all and thank you for having me. Chief, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, a little bit, an overview of everything that we've done in this region uh, as a whole. Um, perfect, prepare a few notes. When taken properly, medications are vital to our health and well-being. However, we're all here today because we recognize that excessive medications pose a serious danger to all of us, and especially our children. To stem the rising tide of medication misuse and abuse, Monadnock Voices has collaborated throughout the region with local agencies, organizations, businesses, and Cheshire County government to develop a comprehensive community-based strategy to reduce or prevent outright medication misuse and accidental poisonings. The community-based strategy has included multiple disposal events over the past year, where over a thousand community members from our region have disposed over a thousand pounds of unused medications. 
a medication disposal mail-in pilot program specifically designed to reach our most vulnerable popu populations. There are students from Keene State College performing an assessment of our region as a part of a research project. We have web-based training modules for local medical providers on best practices for treating chronic pain. There's education to the public in the form of materials and information. And, of course, policy development, namely House Bill 71, as previously mentioned, which was passed into law earlier this year, which created a new chapter in the New Hampshire Controlled Substances Act, which is RSA uh, 318E, which outlines the provisions for medication collection and disposal. And then lastly, of course, a permanent 24-7 medication drop box. So, to the best of our knowledge, this is one of the first of uh, sanctioned permanent drop boxes in our state under this new law. Uh, to use it, it's free and anonymous. It's available 24-7, 365 days a year. Anyone can dispose of over-the-counter or prescription medications as long as medications are in their original containers and are from households. Medications are then incinerated at a municipal solid waste incinerator, which utilizes specialized air quality control measures for emissions. High temperature incineration is a disposal method, which is recommended by the World Health Organization as the best preferred method of disposal for pharmaceuticals. This drop box was made possible only through the generous donations of a number of sponsors, and I'd like to thank them. Our sponsors include the Elm City Rotary Club, who purchased the box, Budget Blinds of Keene, who assisted with the shipping and handling, an anonymous donor who also assisted with the shipping and handling, Point Advertising of Concord, New Hampshire, who had generously donated the labeling for the box, and then the Keene Police Department, who has been an <coughs> ideal community collaborator county, New Futures, a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization whose mission it is to advocate, educate, and collaborate to reduce alcohol and other drug problems in New Hampshire, and who provided invaluable information throughout the legislative process to those of us in our region. Our multiple local alcohol and other drug prevention coalitions throughout the region. Our law enforcement agencies, especially those who have participated in the take back events over the past 12 months. The Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA who have provided an invaluable service by assisting in the disposal of medications during take-back events. The New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office and Department of Justice, New Hampshire Department of Safety, the New Hampshire Board of Pharmacy, the New Hampshire Medical Society, Dr. Seddon Savage, who developed the web-based training modules for medical providers, <coughs> our local me media collaboration, including the Keene Sentinel, the Nanoc Shopper News, and I'm not Thank you um, to the Elm City Rotary. I mean, it just is amazing the partnership that developed around this whole effort. And, you know, everybody's spoken to that uh, this morning, and um, we couldn't have done it without you. So thank, thank you. you so much. And most importantly, thank you, Ken. Uh, the Elm City Rotary Club is proud to support this essential service to area residents by funding the Dropbox, which provides added protection to some of the most vulnerable members of our communities. We applaud Tom, absolutely applaud him for his leadership and Chief Mayo for his support of this Dropbox. It's rather timely, I have to be going through the paper on Sunday and one day I see an article about how prescription drugs are accidentally poisoning children. So the message is very, very clear. With that said, my wife went through our little tiny house with just two people and found a massive amount of unused both prescription and over-the-counter drugs. So today we can do the ceremony of dump for the first one. You can take the bag for it. Yep, okay. <laughs> and Lisa, one of our other members, happened to come here with some additional drugs this morning with us to make another contribution. With that, I'll turn to the time and give you congratulations. So, welcome back. The next big event that happened in Keene was Saturday at, at Keene State College. It was the unveiling of the, the bust of Granny D and the opening of the archives of Granny D's um, memorabilia. For the people who don't know who Granny D was, Granny D was a, <clears throat> a classy lady from Dublin, probably about maybe, excuse me, five foot one and a pistol, a woman of conviction. If she saw something wrong, she stood up. One of the things that I found out um, Saturday was she was the one that fought to prevent the four-lane highway from Manchester to Albany, New York that was supposed to go right through Monadnock in, in downtown Keene. So she's been an activist from at least 1971. 
Who is Granny D? Granny D, at the age of 88, went out to Pasadena, California, and walked 3,200 miles from Pasadena to Washington, D.C., averaging about 10 miles a day, making a um, countless number of friends uh, as she crossed the country. She did it in support of the Fine Gold McCain campaign finance bill, a bill that was to put a kind of a limit on um, campaign financing with the goal of maybe giving um, the, our not federal elections back to us, the people. The unfortunately, recently the Supreme Court ruled it parts of it unconstitutional, which now allows um, unlimited campaign financing and now, and now we're seeing some of the, um, the problems with that. <clears throat> After making her trip back from um, cross country and in DC and saying, hey, this is what I want, she didn't come back to New Hampshire and just sit around. She became even more of an activist going around countries, around the United States, trying to get young women and working women to um, sign up to vote. The unfortunate part of voter registration, a lot of working women, single mothers, voter registration happened during, during their work time. They couldn't afford to take time off from work to, to go and register. Well, if you miss four hours, five hours, you're a single mother and getting a little bit more than minimum wage or 10, 12 bucks an hour, that's a serious problem. So what Granny D and some other women would do was they would go to your these women's jobs and they would fill in where it was clerical. In one case, um, she filled in as um, an alligator feeder. So an 18-year-old girl could go in and register to vote. Her goal was to give women and working women a voice in um, government. Again, to show how fiery a pistol she was, she went into some of the worst um, housing projects in place cities like Chicago, place where a lot of police would not want to go. And um, one of the things that she had stated was that, um, that from the outside, they looked dangerous, but when she went inside, the people were real people. The houses were spotless. The kids were well taken care of, not fitting any of the stereotypes that um, we see on TV not full of gangsters and drug dealers and all that. Yes, they were there, but these were working women, a lot again, a lot of single mothers who were fighting to do what's best for their kids, get their kids a quality education so they'd get a, a chance in life. What, what did De Granny D do after the election? The Democratic Party in um, New Hampshire, no one wanted to step up and run against Sen Senator Judd Gregg they felt that it would be a waste of time and they didn't want to fight because they thought they were going to lose. Granny D, in her 90s, stood up and said, if no one wants to run, I will run because that's how a democracy works. You have to have competition in a democracy. And she ran against um, Senator Gregg. Of course, the outcome was pretty well um, expected. She didn't win. But again, like the old Rocky movie, sometimes you get the hell beat out of you, but you're still the win winner because you stood up. Unfortunately, Granny D died about a year and a half ago at the, at, at the age of 100. She had a long life. Um, her memoirs and a lot of her papers and works were um, donated to the Keene State um, College. They had the archives. And so anybody who wants to do re the research worldwide, they come to Keene and they find out what was the real Granny D. She's got um, letters from the vice president, president, <clears throat> heads of state, senators. It's just amazing. And even for the people of Keene, you should be going down to Keene State College and looking at um, Granny D's um, collection. What I found really great about going down there, there's a book. It said people who had the courage to stand up and say the truth. Granny D is in that book. And she's an inspiration. And when you read her stuff and see what she, she went through, even the shoes she walked across the country are there. It kind of doesn't matter how big you are. 
it kind of goes, you, you're humble in her presence. It just wants you to go out and say, I can do something to make this country better. So again, I recommend that you go down and see um, Granny D. One final thing before we go to the clip, there's going to be a gentleman, um, Mr. Hacker. He is in his um, 90s. Um, he came up to, for this dedication because he felt it was really important. This man is momentous in his own, um, in his own right, a combat um, historian during World War II. He, um, <clears throat> he worked for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He worked for um, President Truman. Again, this individual has, has a wealth of knowledge. He then, be, after um, working for Truman, he became um, a congressman from West Virginia. Again, he was invited up to, uh, by Kent, Mr. Mrs. Kennedy, up to um, Massachusetts for one of the Profile and Courage events because he took on the coal miner, the coal companies in West Virginia after a serious um, number of accidents where a large number of men were getting killed in the coal mines. He said it was his responsibility to protect the people of West Virginia and he went after um, the coal miners and he was instrumental in passing the, um, the coal top, hilltop um, bill. Again, another man of, of courage. Um, he's written a number of books. I think you can go in Granny D's. You'll be able to find out and get his address or even know some of the book. Again, two powerful individuals, well knowledgeable, strength of character, strength of conviction. So, again, before we go to the clip, it's a little shaky at the beginning. I'm working on it, so I hope you enjoy.
and he interviewed a lot of the top uh, officials under Hitler before Nuremberg, and he's got uh, a book that he's written about that. He's written a dozen books. Some of them are here today. Uh, he then, uh, when he came back from World War II, he then he got the he got the position with Franklin Roosevelt because of a student. And it was a student in his class when he was just finishing his PhD dissertation at Columbia. He was teaching there. And it was a student who introduced him to the top speech writer that Franklin Roosevelt had. Well then, later, he was teaching at Princeton. And one of the students in his class, first name was Clifford. And one day the student told him that Clifford came from his uncle, who was Clark Clifford. And he asked the students and his professor if they would like to go down and meet his uncle in Washington one day. And so they took him up on it. And they got to walk and Clark Clifford then asked them if they would like to meet the president, Harry Truman. They all said yes. And so they had a meeting with the president. And at that time, the president pulled their professor aside and asked him if he would do a special project for him, which he agreed to do. And it took him several months. And then the result of that, he became part of the staff. At the time, the White House was being done over because it was in a shambles during those years. And he ended up serving with Harry Truman. So to think of it that Franklin Roosevelt was elected just under 70 years ago to have someone amidst us here that was part of, of that is, is really remarkable. Well, Ken met up with, then after Harry Truman left, he became a congressman. He served for 18 years in the Congress. He was a sponsor of the landmark mine legislation in 1969. Two years ago at the Kennedy Library, every year they have a contest for high school students across the country, and they ask them to write an essay about someone in American history they believe showed uncommon courage, which we know Granny D certainly has displayed. And this, this boy, a 17-year-old in Chattanooga, Tennessee, wrote about Ken Heckler, because remember there was a mine disaster in West Virginia a few years ago, and People were reading about it, and so he looked into it, and he found what he did. And he wrote about it, and he won the essay contest, and he won $10,000. And they called Ken and asked Ken if he would come to the Kennedy Library, spend some time with Caroline Kennedy, uh, because the contest was based on her father's book, Profiles in Courage. And then Ken decided that he would run for governor, and he ends up having a primary contest against a fellow who spent $26 million of his own money, Jay Rockefeller, and Ken was not successful. And then Ken became Secretary of State. At the age of 70, he became Secretary of State. And he served 16 years, and that's how I got to meet him. And the first time I met him, the opportunity to talk to someone like that is just beyond belief, because the stories that he has are, are, are just incredible. And in, in 1999, Granny D was on that march. And we were meeting in St. Louis, the Secretaries of State, in the summer. We meet in a different state each summer. And as Granny D was coming through... For those exaggerations, I appreciate them all. <laughs> and Lee Stevenson said, Flattery is okay if you don't inhale it. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Teen State College for uh, accepting and making available this priceless collection. I know it's, I'm, it's priceless because I'm part of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's a wonderful tribute to uh, the president, to the college, that you have uh, accepted and uh, are arranging and making available this collection. Uh, in the fall of 18, 
1989, I got a telephone call one day from a young lady named Heidi Becker who worked for the National Voting Rights Institute in Boston. And she said, I've got an interesting piece of news for you. There's a lady up in New Hampshire in the town of Dublin who has decided to walk from the Pacific Ocean to the nation's capital on behalf of campaign finance reform. And I said, give me her phone number right away. I want to call her. So I called Granny D on the phone. And I said, what a wonderful idea. What? Pretty soon all the gays and all the lesbians and all the other people with causes will want to ride. <laughs> so, sorry, we can't let you. So I made a crude sign <laughs> and said on it, why ban Granny D on Rose Bowl Parade? And I said, let's go up to where people have their sleeping bags along the boulevard where the parade was going. I held up this sign and people would say to me, why are they not denying her an opportunity to ride the parade? And who is Granny D? And I said, well, there she is. She'll explain it to you. So she did it and she got hundreds of signatures on the petition to uh, enact the McCain-Feingold bill. And the McCain-Feingold bill was enacted uh, by the congressman. She walked her 3,200 miles. I walked the first 100 miles with her up until her, but it was a real pleasure to be walking with her. She's a bag of memories and uh, has a bag of memories. And uh, she could recite, uh, she could recite Robert Foss's poems from start to finish, which eases the pain of walking 10 miles. And uh, she got started one day on Barbara Fritchie. And she said, Dennis Burke's home state of Arizona has enabled people to talk about issues instead of wasting their time dialing for dollars. She was clearly a woman, a person way, way ahead of her time. And I stand here to tell you today to tell you what a wonderful person Doris Granny D. Haddock was, how wonderful it was not to get to know her, but also to walk with her. I had a full-time job as Secretary of State, but on weekends and holidays and whenever I could get away, I walked a total of 530 miles, but that's nothing compared with the 3,200 that she walked. The greatest heroine I've ever met. Thank you. I'm a heroine here today because she was always there for Granny D, and Granny D's son in the background is Libby Haddock.
long before she became the world's Granny D. And it is good to see many from far away, and nearby too, who came because of how she changed their lives, just as she changed my life. There are literally hundreds, indeed multiple hundreds, of others who wanted to be here today, but they could not. Some with health issues, other with financial limitations, and many with obligations that they felt they must keep. Doris would have understood, and she would have encouraged them to attend to those needs. I did not know Granny D as long as some did, but I know that I was tremendously blessed, unbelievably fortunate to have been with her so much for the last several years of her life, presumably assisting her. That's funny, because in reality, I was having a ball, learning, being accepted, trusted, and encouraged. She knew she was making a difference, but also, that she was mortal, and that she one way that she could continue to help others would be for her materials related to her work be kept together and easily accessible to all. We developed very specific criteria. We sought places across the country that could meet them, and we explored other places that expressed an interest. Unfortunately, it was not until after Granny D died, but happily before her late son Jim, also her chief advisor and her principal facilitator, died earlier this year, that people began to point out the obvious, that what we've been seeking was really right here beneath our noses, here in our own backyard. Credit goes to Keene State College professor and state legislator Chuck Weed to New Hampshire Secretary of State, Bill Gardner, and to Walter Peterson, our late governor, and everyone's state person, and his beloved wife, Dorothy. Yes, Keene State College was the only place that met all of the criteria. When I first traveled out of state with Granny D, I was nervous, and I asked Jim how I best, my best served as for traveling companion. And his first piece of advice was, never speak for my mother. <laughs> well, today I say, I believe that if she were here, and indeed I think we all feel that she is here in spirit and in each of us, I think she'd be just awfully happy. She'd be pleased. She would thank you all. And then she'd give everyone another great, big, warm hug of encouragement. Enjoy today. She want you to. The college wants you to. Enjoy your memories. And in your own individual ways, what you can do to make your own difference. Use your own power of one, but always for the good of all. I'd like to quote a close friend of Granny Dee's, another social activist, folk musician, legend, Pete Seeger. You can listen to his words yourself because they are on a little video about Pete and Doris. A copy is here in the archive. Pete says, I think that through the ages, Granny Dee is going to be one of the most, most famous Americans of this century. And so I close with a challenge for you. Granny D played her part well for over a century. Now it is So welcome back. Sunday, the Clarence DeMar Marathon, the 34th running of the marathon. For a while, it looked like this, or this year or possibly next year was going to be the last um,
Clarence DeMar um, Marathon. This was year 34. I guess they were looking at, at 35 as a nice round number to call it quits. And um, like I said, it's been a, it's been a staple of the Keene uh, Mananak area. And I got, I ran it, I won't say how long, the, shoot, maybe about 25, um, 30 years ago. I was lucky when I was younger and skinnier. I finished in um, eighth place, quality race. I think way back that was Peter Hanahan was um, in charge of, of that race. This year, um, the Rotary Club is, is stepping up. The Rotary from best of what I found out is the Rotary Club is going to um, take control over the, um, the marathon and run it as, as a fundraiser. The Rotary Club, um, quality organization, help fund the um, drop box. They do a great job bringing international students to the high school and now they're going to take over um, an icon event from the, uh, from the Keene area. A race that goes from Giltsum through the surrounding areas and ending up at the college. So, the first male finisher, again, you can go to the Keene Sentinel. Today's the 25th Keene Sentinel, and they have a list of all the um, finishers of the race. But right off the bat, the first male is Brad Meesh, 24, of Hadley, Mass. In two hours and 24, 33 minutes. The first female is Krista Hanks of Roanoke, Virginia, at 328.17, finishing 21st overall. The first keen male is Christopher Riley, finished 25th place, 3 hours and 17 minutes, followed by Mac Florens, I probably pronounced it wrong, 33, the 22nd um, finisher overall. The first local finisher from Keen, Julie West, 47 years old, I guess I can get away with using her age because it's in the newspaper, finishing 44th overall for 3 hours and 43 minutes. And right behind her is Jamie Makowski. She's 33 at, with a finish time of 3.45. And things of note, it's about 200 um, runners. And we may think of it as a, as a local race, but it's not local. It's, I guess it's well known. Third place finisher, J.D. Laval, 24, Boulder, Colorado, 251. Fourth place finisher, Gary Kruger, 26, from Tempe, Arizona, with a 257. Fifth place finisher from my home state, Jerry Reef, Reef R-I-E-F, 46, from Cheyenne, Wyoming. So, while it may not be a big race, it still brings people to Keene, and they know what Keene is like. And again, they have a great time, and they also spend money in Keene. So, I'm going to show about a two-minute um, clip. It's just the um, people talking and the run is finishing, and I just kept my mouth shut. So I hopefully you'll enjoy what part of the marathon's about.
Welcome back. We're going to finish this up right now. And um, while my goal is we're still going to have um, studio guests, what I'm going to try to do more and more in the future is go out around Keene and see some of the things that are happening around Keene. For example, the fire station construction. They were pulling some forms off, and now you can see how the fire station's coming up. We'll talk about um, how important it was to spend that money for earthquake after F5.8. We're going to look at Southwest Workforce Housing, and then we're going to look at the, um, the new um, private campus, off-campus housing dorms for King State students and maybe talk about the effect that it's going to have on the housing and maybe bringing in more families that have been priced out of the Keene er Keen city of Keene during the early 2000, 2006 time. Thank you for being with me on the long road. I'll see you next week where my guest will be Ruth Sterling and we'll be talking about the upcoming Keene Pumpkin Fest and our chance and goal of setting a new world record. Again, thank you.